Hello. Um, today, <clears throat> we're going to talk about more modern methods or recently developed methods of approximating uh, unknown functions. Uh, so we're going to talk about first radial basis functions, uh, which are an extension of traditional approximation theory. And then I'm going to take you into the wild, wild world of neural nets, uh, which you've probably heard a lot about, deep learning. Uh, if, if these, these guys are masters of marketing, if nothing else. Um, and so as see, my goal today, as far as neural nets are concerned, is to give you some idea about the, the real mathematics that's going on underneath all of the uh, software and uh, that's behind all of the uh, propaganda. Uh, now I say propaganda, but that um, uh, some of it, it, it they, have, they are justifiably proud of many of their accomplishments uh, in the neural net uh, world, the deep learning world in particular. Um, what astonished me, was amazing to me, was a couple years ago where a computer using uh, deep learning, or cluster probably, um, beat the champion Go player. Now, it was not a horrible surprise that, um, that computers could learn how to play chess better than any human. Uh, but it was thought that uh, it would be a long time, long time, before a computer could challenge humans in the game of Go. Well, that happened a couple years ago, and that was... Uh, uh, Ext astonishing to me. I didn't think I was going to live to see that. So that just gives you an impression just how impressive these tools are. Um, now, uh, okay, little bureaucracy right now. Um, those of you who are taking the course for credit, uh, you need to fill out some uh, evaluation form. Now, officially, the um, email I got from somebody at Zurich says I'm supposed to give you five minutes during the lecture to fill this out. Well, but we're in the electronic age now, and I believe um, everything's online. Um, uh, Carl told me to basically have Philip point out the, um, where you should go on the web to fill out the class evaluation. So you can do this on your own time or if you, or take five minutes in a boring part of today's lecture and do it. But anyway, there's, there's some online place where you can go to evaluate the course. The deadline for this is uh, uh, May 17, which I guess is Sunday. So um, yeah, please do that, give your evaluation. And then uh, Philip's job is to bug you to make sure you you do this by the deadline. Okay, another organizational thing is that now I was supposed to be in Zurich today, um, but I'm not. Uh, now on the syllabus, you will see where uh, I'm supposed to be um, available for office hours, as we call it, uh, where you could uh, uh, chat with me um, at a convenient time, not that, the plant, the, the advantage of being in Zurich is I'd be in the same time zone as, as you Europeans. But in any case, um, uh, this is a point in time in the course where uh, I am quite willing to talk with people about their PhD work, about uh, computational problems in their PhD, that they're getting, um, having in their PhDs research or other research. And so because now you can come to me, we can talk about things, you know the basic computational tools, and then we can find where uh, what I've been teaching you can be helpful. So feel free to email me um, that our office hour times are going to be 
like in your evening, uh, certainly not before the lecture time, um, but you're, you're all stuck at home anyway, so it doesn't matter. So, um, but feel free to um, contact me and we'll set up a time for a, a private Zoom meeting like this. Uh, Zoom meeting, but then private where you can talk about your research. And I do look forward to many of you taking advantage of that. Even those of you who are not taking the course, this, I'm saying this not just to the, um, the Zurich people, but to all, all, of, all of you. Now, let's get on with um, uh, the topics today. So I'm going to do the sh share the screen thing today. Okay. And then, um, okay, I got to move that over there. And I've got chat up, so um, uh, feel free to type in any questions on chat. Oh, one more thing while I'm getting arranged this. I am going to be doing um, some extra lectures on um, related topics, and I'll be announcing them um, at the suitable time. Um, but those are not those. Those will be at times other than the official uh, lecture times. And so, uh, you know, it's, it, um, you know, tune in if you find the topics interesting. Um, by the way, if you have some particular request for a topic that you think I might have something to say on, please email me because uh, maybe there's something of interest to you that, um, um, I may, I may be wi willing to talk about that, uh, um, would, would be good. So just send me suggestions. Now, first, radial basis function network. Um, radial basis functions, um, are there, they, mathematicians have been developing radial basis functions for a few decades now. And uh, I'm going to show you one dimensional examples because that's what I can do easily. Um, but they are, one should think of radial basis functions as generalizations of splines to multiple dimensions. See, the problem with a lot of the other approximation methods we have, uh, po polynomial-like and, and ordinary one-dimensional splines, is that when you go to higher dimensions, you often run into a, certainly with splines, a cursed dimensionality problem. And then with polynomials, you can avoid cursed dimensionality, but then you get into complex issues about uh, finding the right set of nodes. Radial basis functions are really, you think of them as, an, an extension of um, splines to multiple dimensions. Um, now, the key property about radial basis functions is that if you want to interpolate, there's always a solution. There's always a unique interpolant. Um, I know in my book, maybe I didn't, didn't mention it in my lecture, but in my book I have showed an example where that's not true in uh, even in two dimensions. You could have four points <coughs> in two dimensions and say, and then four functions, and then you ask for the interpolant and there is no interpolant. The thing about radial basis functions is that <coughs> there is always a unique interpolant. So you don't have to worry about that. And there's a lot of other very nice properties. But I'm gonna just show you the one dimension. Now, by the way, what I've done here today is I've uh, loaded in um, some uh, pictures I took uh, from elsewhere. Um, so these are unfortunately a bit fuzzy, but I think I've got it to the point where you, you these are understandable. <clears throat> now, RBF, radial basis function. 
that now the typical radial basis function is the Gaussian. That's uh, this one here. This is the Gaussian. Oh, that makes it even worse. But anyway, um, so it's just basically the exponent of negative. Now, this is epsilon r squared. Now, you're going to see epsilon r in all of these. The epsilon term is a, a scaling parameter or a tuning parameter, as we call it. Now, the key thing about the Gaussian, is, the Gaussian function is that it has the bell curve. You know, it's uh, high in the, around zero and then it tails off nicely. Uh, and then the epsilon um, is, a, in radial basis function language, is a tuning parameter. Now, basically, it looks a lot like, uh, I could put R over sigma, where sigma is a standard deviation of a random variable, and then it looks like a, a standard normal random variable. Um, but, um, and, and, but we, t we use epsilon here in, in the, as multiplying R as a tuning parameter. Now, the key thing about the Gaussian and the key thing about all radial basis functions is that they are close, they are either zero or they're basically equal to zero for most of the domain. So the Gaussian density, for example, is um, at, at zero, it has height one, but then uh, the function tails off and after r equals, you know, after, you know, plus or at about sig three sigma, four sigma, it's the function's basically equal to zero. So that's the key thing about radial basis functions, is that the essential support of the function is small. Um, and that, of course, is the essence of a spline, the, a, base, uh, a B spline, for example. It's, it's, it is zero everywhere except for a small part of the domain. So in that sense, this is why radial basis functions are really ex extensions of the idea behind splines, but going to multiple high dimensions. So um, here's the Gaussian function. Another one that's used is the multi-quadric function, then the inverse quadratic and the inverse multi-quadric. Anyway, all of these have the property that, um, okay. these have the property that as r goes to infinity, plus or minus infinity, the function goes to zero. The multi-quadric um, isn't, you know, it's quite the opposite. It becomes very big. So it, it still is in the family of radial basis functions, but uh, it's a bit odd. Um, however, it does apparently have some use. Then there's the polyharmonic spline. Uh, no. There's the thin plate spline. Um, but then there's a family of RBFs that are called the compactly supported RBFs. So these are radial basis functions, uh, which literally have compact support. So the bump function is, is for r less than one over epsilon, it equals uh, what looks like a nice little bump, and then it's zero otherwise. And notice that there is a, um, at r equals one, at r equals one over epsilon, uh, then uh, this becomes zero, by the way, because it, r equals one over epsilon, then epsilon times r becomes one, this becomes uh, one over zero, and so this does become zero for r um, equal to one over epsilon, and so then basically it's a smooth function that is um, non-zero for r less than, um, magnitude of r less than one over epsilon, and so this really is an extension of the idea of a spline. Now, we, you notice that we say R here. This is all scalar, but when we go to um, higher dimensions, the radial basis function is phi evaluated at the norm of a vector x. Um, so R should be thought of in if we were in multidimensional space, R is the norm of the vector, um, um, the length, the Euclidean length of a vector um, 
of length from of going from zero to x. So that's this is something that um, then you can see ultimately be, quickly becomes more um, general to arbitrary dimensions. Now, I'm going to just play around with it a bit, give you a feeling of what it can be can be done. Uh, so we're going to define the ba a radial basis function. I'm going to just stay now with the with the the standard nice um, uh, Gaussian um, decision, uh, Gaussian basis radial basis function. I'm going to create a data set, which is going to be sine of x squared over four plus x. And see, it's it's a sinusoidal thing. It's wiggly, but not in a uniform fashion. I'm going to take 11 uniformly distributed points in minus five to five. And then now with radial basis functions, these are typically used for interpolation. So if I've got 11 points, I'm going to create 11 radial basis functions. And if I'm going to create data at a minus five, minus four, blah, 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 at the, at the integer points, then what I'm going to do is include in the basis radial basis functions which are set which are centered at the individual data x values in the data so this is this is um a way in which it's standardly used is you have data at a bunch of y's and x's and then what you do is you stick a radial basis function centered on an x in the data set and then uh here the data here is minus, is minus four, minus five, et cetera. So we stick a radial basis function at each one of those um, uh, points. And then we take a weight, linearly weighted sum of these, of, the out, of these RBFs. And that is going to be um, the model that we're going to use, the uh, um, functional form that we're going to use with unknown coefficients A1, A2, et cetera. Um, now, this is for now the, that was all defined for arbitrary epsilon. Now, we're going to just look at what happened. So, for epsilon equals one, the natural thing to look at. Here's the basis that we're working with, and notice that each of the neural nets are centered at one of the uh, data points. Um, and uh, note, ma Mathematica produces multi colored graphs nicely. So those are the basis functions. Um, and now then um, you might ask, well, how good are these for approximation purposes? Well, notice that each of them, each radial basis function is non-zero over a over a part of the domain. And so when you want you, when you're thinking about using them for approximation, what you want to know is <clears throat> well how correlated are are them are they, are they so then what I did is I just integrated the cross products of each of these and then got a matrix and then took the eigenvalues and what we can see is that the condition number of the covariance matrix is uh, quite small it's on the order of 100 so this is in terms of being able to solve the interpolation problem that's going to be easy uh, numerically and um, so here is the result now by the way they didn't they did a pretty good job actually when you look at it um, now notice that you see it's you're not surprised that it did a good job around here because the the radial basis function centered at four kind kind of matched the 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 unknown the, no, the known function we're trying to match over here somehow we got all these the all these uh, uh, normals uh, based at minus five, minus four, minus three, minus two, and minus one, etc., to add up to something that was very nice and smooth and not not so wiggly. And then I computed the L two norm of that, and that's a pretty small number. Now I'm going to have epsilon go up to two. Now what that means is that this is like the variant because epsilon multiplies. You see, remember, um, epsilon multiplies the x. So an epsilon of two is like having a standard deviation of one over square root two. Um, so this is like reducing the uh, variance. And so now these, these things are going to get tighter and spikier. Again, they should do well in terms of 
the they they should in terms of solving the interpolation problem it'll be easy because the the eigenvalues of the covariance matrix is um, are well behaved but we see that no these these are too too tight what happens is that these get very tight and spiky at their individual data points and so right you have like an extra spike here because of the see there's an RBF at minus two minus three and minus one and it's hard to get them organized to to interpolate the data between those points and uh, so that's not doing as well um the l2 norm is higher now let's try something where we i uh, have increased you said what looks like increased the variance what we've done is made epsilon smaller and now these things are flatter now these things they look like they're going to be harder to solve because the covariance matrix is nearly singular the conditional the condition number is like uh, uh 17. so this is going to be harder to solve numerically however um um mathematic had no problem with it but what we see is that um it doesn't do as good a job now now so I basically this the point of this is just to show you what a radio basis function looks like. Um, to point out how you do interpolation with radio basis functions. And the thing is that if if our data points were multidimensional, it's it's ex you proceed exactly as we did before. There is this tuning parameter which needs to be chosen. And uh, this is where uh, you have to rely on some other, some external knowledge about the um, problem in order to choose um, the tuning parameter. Um, on the other hand, what is I think obvious for economists to do, let's say if you're gonna use radial basis functions to solve one of those simple uh, optimal growth models that we saw, um what you can do is always uh you know um solve it you know make a guess as to what epsilon should be and then look to see at how well uh the approximation is doing at points other than the convocation points and then you um that's a matter of bringing in extra information and then you choose epsilon so as to um make things um better at points in between the nodes that you chose for co-location. So um, there's also some strange things about um, neural nets, I mean, the radio basis functions. I showed you the flatter ones and you might say, well, well that, that sounds like a bad idea because it's so ill-conditioned. It turns out that, that asymptotically as the data goes um, in size increases, uh, the flat ones actually become very good and useful, um, they obviously are gonna have problems because of the ill conditioning of the, uh, of the covariance, but, um, but there are methods to get around this. So I'm just, I just toss them in here for, in this case, um, just to inform you that uh, uh, the choice of epsilon, the choice of the tuning parameter is uh, something that could lead to flat bases, could lead to uh, bases with moderate spikes. Um, this is something that um, one has to determine by adding in some more information. But now, um, but I have seen papers where they use radial basis functions, for example, to solve a, um, a Black Scholes equation, a partial differential equation. So this is um, uh, so this is um, often used and potential now now radial basis functions are an example of a simple form of neural net um but now we're going to go into neural nets so first what i'm going to do is introduce you to the sigmoid function now by the way sigmoid is going to look a lot like uh, logit i think um and in fact let's Here's the depth, here's the basic sigmoid function, um, one over one plus e, e to the minus x. 
And uh, this is, um, correct me if I'm wrong, this is the logit, right, basically. So, but now in approximation theory, they call this the sigmoid function. I don't know why, but anyway. So here's a sigmoid function um, that, um, that was gonna be the basis for a lot of what we're gonna be doing in neural nets. Now, what I'm gonna be doing is using the sigmoid function in this set of slides as a way to approximate a function. But again, just, um, by the way, you, you see this sigmoid function, you can think of it as being centered um, at zero. It's set because at, at zero, it equals 0.5. It's centered at zero. By the way, the derivative of this isn't the Gaussian, but you know, it's gonna look kind of like a Gaussian. It's gonna go up and it comes down. So it, this one is centered at zero. Now we can center other um, logit functions at other points. Obviously this, uh, this whatever that color is, is centered at zero. This one is centered at minus one. This one's centered at minus two, et cetera. Um, and so now we're gonna take these 11 nodes um, between minus five and five. And those are gonna be the basis that we're gonna use for a linear approximation. We're still getting staying with linear approximation. Um, and um, now what we're gonna do is, is uh, now what we're gonna do is fit an example function. Now sigmoids are not terribly useful for interpolation. So what we're gonna do is create a data set of, uh, we have the, just a function sine of x, a data set of 21 points between minus five and five. And then what we're gonna do is, um, yeah, that is, yeah. So now we're gonna do least squares fit of those sigmoid functions. And again, very, really quite nice fit. So it's for, now if I did, if I did an interpolation, this wouldn't be so good, but for least squares it is. Now here's a little code I wrote up, so I called script. So now then I put in other functions. Now. Um, I said, how about the function that's zero and then it go, it's equal to the function X and then at two, it switches to being constant at three. Now, so this is a, um, uh, anyway, it's, it's a function with two kinks. Now notice I have 21 data points and I'm doing 11 basis functions and the sigmoid does pretty well. Whereas if I just did ordinary polynomials or uh, I, they would typically have more problems handling this kink. Uh, so this is, um, you know, this is an example of flexibility of it. Here's a function over one, one over one plus x squared. Uh, this is the Runga function. And we see that uh, with 21 data points and 11 basis functions, this is handling it well. Remember that interpolation with polynomials, this goes very bad. And here's just a log function. And then here's a bit more challenging sine of x squared over three plus x. Now the data is the point and we see that it's struggling, but it does a decent fit. Now, the key thing is that as I increased the number of points and the number of sigma functions I use, this is going to, um, sigma function, this is gonna work out. So this is an uh, approximation method that will, um, be, be, can be thought of as a substitute for polynomials in terms of creating a basis. The nice thing about the sigmoid function is that it is bounded everywhere. It's bounded below by zero, bounded above by one. Whereas your polynomials like x squared, x cubed, x fourth, x fifth, they're all explosive asymptotically. So a sigmoid basis has the advantage of being bounded globally. So you don't have um, this problem about um, things going crazy um, when you, uh, for large values of sigma, of x, of x. Now, okay, but that's just using the sigmoid function for um, simple standard approximation. Now, um, okay, I thought I had, okay. Oh, 
Yeah, okay. Now, neural networks have become very popular. On the other hand, pick up almost any book on neural nets, particularly if it's written by a computer scientist, you'll have no, under, no comprehension of what's going on. Uh, first of all, these books, uh, typical book, and even a lot of the papers begin with, um, oh, they'll have a picture of a neuron in a brain. Um, and of course, this neural networks are motivated by the observations about how the brain is organized, that you have neurons and they're all connected in a big network. Um, now, this may have been some historical motivation for neural nets, but, um, but it's, I find those biological um, analogs to be uh, um, of limited value. For example, I pointed out that uh, uh, Tatanama method for computation is biologically very similar to um, uh, a rabid dog going around in circles. So, uh, okay, but is that a, it's a good analogy, but it certainly doesn't um, endorse the idea of using Tatanama as a computational method. So biology, um, you know, uh, it has lots of ideas. This is, happens to be one where the idea works out well, even when we try to use it in, um, in approximation. But the language um, that's used, for example, what they call learning. So what happens with neural networks is that you have some object, some data, and you want to think, think about it as you want to approximate it. Some, some, there's a function from the data to output and you want to approximate that. And so they talk about learning. Whereas when you look underneath what's going on, all they're doing in many cases is just nonlinear least squares. That's it. They may they have so, all sorts of stories about learning this, learning that. It's just nonlinear least squares. That's the fundamental problem they're trying to solve. And then they talk about, oh, back propagation. Back propagation is only really is just a way to compute the derivatives of the neural net, and it's just automatic differentiation. Stochastic gradient descent, well, that's just uh, you, you you're doing a you're doing a nonlinear least squares, so you want to find the minimum. The minimize the loss function. So one way to do that is to look for the steepest uh, descent direction. Um, we saw that that wasn't a terribly good idea in general in optimization. Um, stochastic gradient descent is where you you just do a small sampling on the data to see what the gradient should be. So it's a noisy steepest descent. Now, why are they using methods which we would frown on in general. The reason is because the optimization problems are enormous. This will typically be a nonlinear least squares, but with possibly millions of parameters to uh, salt compute. So it's an enormous optimization problem. Uh, there's no way that in general you could use any kind of Newton method or even quasi-Newton method to find the minimum. So they have to um, work, use these other methods for optimization, which standard optimization theory has abandoned, but because these optimization problems are so enormous, they have to proceed in this direction because this is something Stochastic uh, gradient descent is something that is, is feasible to do in this context. And so then um, you, again, you can do this. You do, that's why then they do this. And then, so they go yakety yak on about learning and all this. It really is just talking about th those issues are just ones of what's, how to come up with a, a, a descent direction and how to use that descent information to update your guess. That's, that's what they're doing. Now, the other thing is I'm going to give you some basic mathematical ideas. Now, with orthogonal polynomials, Fourier analysis, there's an enormous amount of mathematics behind all of that. There really aren't 
many ideas here that are mathematically um, found, found um, based. Uh, there are some basic theorems that say that neural nets can approximate pretty much any function that you care about. This is, um, these are called, uh, these, these, these theorems prove that these the neural nets are, are universal approximators. Now you will hear, you will see uh, my, um, neural net propaganda people talk about, oh, this is great, wonderful. Yeah, but it's the same thing with polynomials. They can also approximate anything you care about or Fourier series or anything. So there's nothing new there in terms of the um, universal approximation properties. I saw a macro paper last fall talking about neural nets and how great they are. And it's, it's universal approximation um, property. And so the guy wrote down this universal approximation there. And I said, you know, that's also true of polynomials. And he, he, he was surprised. He didn't know that. So the thing is that, again, this is um, that there are theorems proving universal approximation properties. Um, one of the basic theorems is uh, made by a guy named Baron, B-A-R-R-O-N. Uh, also, there was work, um, the work was done in the 1980s. I don't know exactly the years of the publication, but I knew in the 1980s, I knew about universal approximation theorems proven by um, economists, Hal White, um, Stinchcomb, and Hornick um, had papers um, at that time showing that neural nets were universal approximators and good ones. Now, okay, so if this was all known back in the 1980s, here we are 20 plus years uh, later and we're just starting to see it being used. Why? Well, the thing was that back in the 80s and early 90s, when the theorems being proven, neural nets were just discarded as being impractical because the nonlinear least squares fitting problem made it very difficult to find the global min. You'd easily get, with the methods that they were talking about then, it'd be easy to get stuck at local min. So solving the fitting problem was considered um, just impractical. That yes, there were these nice theoretical properties, but practically they, they were, in all practical terms, useless. Now, there were a few papers that would occasionally use them um, and applications. Um, I was editor of JEDC and accepted a paper by uh, Kevin Hassett and Alan Arbach that used neural nets to solve a model like, um, um, like this simple growth model. By the way, um, you heard right, that was Kevin Hassett, who now is. Uh, busy help in work, working in the White House. And as he says, uh, it's a scary environment because he's worried about getting COVID. But, you know, same guy. Um, and, but, you know, it was, it was a nice paper, but it didn't really, nothing caught fire because of it. Um, uh, so, but now what's happened in the last 20 years is that um, we, that these people have developed better methods for solving enormous optimization problems. Basically stochastic gradient descent and a variety of other um, improvements. The other thing that's happened is massive parallelization. Massive parallelization, and this can be parallelized. So the combination of, as well as computers being faster, that this is not just a matter of hardware being, the improvements is not just hardware being faster. Yes, the hardware is faster, but now you can take those faster CPUs, tie them together using massive parallelization. And furthermore, you now have better algorithms that come from mathematical thinking um, to solve the fitting problems. And that's why now neural nets are popular. The other thing that's helped is that Google has spent an enormous amount of money uh, developing software and then giving it away for free. Um, and so I'm talking about TensorFlow. So you not only have 
faster CPUs, as well as the hardware that allows for massive parallelization, as well as the improvement in the algorithms to solve enormous optimization problems. But on top of that, you had Google basically create the software and give it away so people can now use those um, ideas in an effective manner. So there's, you know, there's, there's a, a, a combination of positive things that have happened that brought us to this point. Now, we're gonna define a neural node. Uh, first of all, I'm gonna, okay. Right now, we're just gonna have G be our node function abstractly. The key thing is that I, this is a mathematical thing that basically says, uh, if you give G a vector, uh, it'll apply G to each component of the vector. Now, I'm gonna give you, define the model. So I'm gonna say we're gonna have five nodes in this neural net. Uh, but then what I'm gonna do is I'm going to create, you see, okay, this is where I'm going down here. This is gonna be the five functions that I'm gonna use for approximation. So each one is, and I don't like, you know, we prefer to see A1, X plus B1. No, mathematics has this ordering system. So it's, but it, this is A1, X plus B1 is then fed into G. So G is some function that will take a scalar and spit out a scalar. And what we're gonna look at here for, for the vector, we have, we have five A's and five B's. And then that this generates five basis functions. Think of them as basis functions. But now notice that um, the A and B are now um, free parameters. Now then we're gonna do the sigmoid function. And now our approximation, the model function for the approximation is going to be a linearly weighted. So here the CI, the C's are the linear weights. So linear weighted sum of the neural oh, nodes, neural nodes, not nodals. So basically our functional form now will take um, these uh, logit type functions. Um, and each, each one of these has a free parameter three parameters A and B, and then each one of these basis functions is multiplied by a C. So now our free parameters include not only the C weights on the basis function, but also the A and I, A and B coefficients that appear nonlinearly. So we're going to now try to fit a function um, using this functional form. Now notice that um, we're going to have five A's, five B's, and five C's. So we're gonna have 15 unknown variables, and I, this is just some, some notation to get, have the initial guess be equal to one for each one. And then now here we're gonna take, this is the function we're gonna to try to approximate. We create 51 data points. By the way, neural nodes, neural nets are used primarily for regression purposes. And so now we're gonna take, we're gonna um, do the least squares. Now, by the way, 51 points, and you see the dots and from that function. And now I'm gonna use those neural nets to uh, fit it. Yeah, yeah, it kind of does an okay job. Um, now, the key thing to note here is that, okay, this is basically solve the least squares problem, but I get, had to say, I said, uh, do, do 500 iterations. And also I said the method should be n minimize. N minimize is a global uh, optimization method. So it has multiple restarts. And actually one of the methods that it uses might be Nelder Mead. So I don't know exactly in this case what it used, but these things take a long time to solve using a regular standard solver. I didn't note the time here. Um, but I should, but so this is, this is a nasty, these are nasty problems. We had 15 coefficients and we got a pretty decent fit. Um, now I'm going to do again, now again, write up a little program and again, 51 points. Now, actually 
the neural net did a pretty good job in terms of that uh, ladder function or whatever it is. Um, it, it, avoid, it, it avoided wiggles around um, the kinks. Did a pretty nice job there. Very nice job on 101 plus x squared. Very nice job on the log thing. And even this one, it did, it did a pretty good job on, on um, uh, this thing also. Now, by the way, um, so anyway, so this appears to be a nice way to handle a variety of functions. And it's, see, like if you took, if you took a polynomial to this, uh, how many bases, well, we have five basis functions. Well, degree five polynomial for this is hopeless, but now we've got this extra nonlinearity since our basis functions are um, the sigmoid functions with parameters in them. And anyway, so even this one, um, now you see one thing, by the way, this is least squares. If I really wanted to do this, I would do least squares, but then impose that it, it, that it got, got the endpoints right. That would help it. By the way, if I had used Chebyshev, see, <clears throat> if I had used Chebyshev points, this would also help it because, so a lot of those ideas, you know, like, for Chebyshev, for polynomial interpolation, we want to use Chebyshev points, which basically means you, you have more points toward the density of points on the edges is higher. That kind of idea is going to work, is going to help also for here, for here, for other things. So anyway, this is, there are, you know, this is just the first shot at it. One can um, do um, more things. Now notice, what, what did I do here? What did I do? I, the, I basically, the function here is a linear weighted sum of sigmoid functions where the sigmoid, each individual sigmoid function dependent on an A and a B. So it's nonlinear approximation. Now, okay, yes. This is now a more serious, this is now getting closer. This is now a real neural net, not just sort of a toy thing to get you started. Now, what we're now going to do is, there's two inputs now. There's two inputs, there's an X and a Y. And so now this is gonna be a simple little thing where we have, think of it as three basis functions each basis function is a, a neuron and it's applied to a, to a weighted sum of X and Y plus a term called bias B. So each of these basis functions is a, a function of X and Y as well as then a shift parameter. So uh, now then the model for the, the model for the approximation that we're looking at is where you have each of these three basis um, you know, formulas um, and you weight them with a C coefficient and then you add some uh, shift term to it. This is now the functional form of a neural net with two inputs, one output and one hidden layer. Now, by the way, this is another PNG file I put in here for it, so it's a little fuzzy. Now, in general, a neuron, see a neuron, see the definition of a neuron is that you take, you have a activation function as they would call it. And then what you do is you have your data X, which is a vector, and then there's a matrix W so that you apply um, W to the matrix W to the vector X that gives you a vector of numbers. Then you shift those numbers by some sh shift vector B. And then that is fed into the neuron theta. But the key thing is that theta, theta is only defined for scalars 
But then for vectors, what you do is element wise um, execution. So if theta is, this is a key thing in the neural nets thing that sort of puzzled me for a long time in terms of reading the notation is I would see uh, theta is a neuron and yeah, okay, so theta is a neuron. It's, it takes a scalar and spits out a scalar. And so I was wondering, oh, what does it mean? How can it take a vector? And I, because I was thinking too much in sort of an analysis kind of mode, mathematical analysis. Then it, then it hit me, my computer science background is there, but it's older. Really what the computer scientists are thinking of is theta is a function. Now, when you give it a scalar, it gives you out that, you know, logit or whatever functional form, but it's also can be evaluated, thought of as a function of a vector. And then you just say, well, theta of a vector is just a vector where theta is applied to each element. Keep that in mind, and by having that in mind, all sorts of notation I've seen, all of a sudden, the light bulb's up. The light bulb goes on, I understand. And so here, here's then the output, y is some um, theta applied um, element-wise to a vector. And that this can also be a vector. Um, and so here's matrix notation. And so basically what happens is that each one of these y, yi elements is itself a theta evaluated one of the components. This would be the, the theta y1 is theta evaluated the this scalar, which is nothing more than the first row of w applied to the uh, x vector plus a shift b. Okay, so that's mathematically what's going on. Now then, um, this is a short way of writing. Um, so now you, you can think in terms of a network where now you start with a vector x, you give it the, the linear a fine thing, you, that gives you out some output. Call that output y1. You then feed it into another matrix and, and theta, and that's y2, y3 is. So this now is a network with two hidden layers is how they say it, call it. Anyway, so. Now let's time for, you see, the other thing is if you're gonna look at any neural net papers or in the literature of the, or the books, you've got to understand the pictures. They love pictures. And that it's like reading hieroglyphics. You know, they're pictures and how, what do they mean? So this is what a single neuron, you may see a neuron as being, as represented basically this, this, whole thing based at neurons often are represented as X's go into a circle and then output comes out. But this is what goes on inside a, a particular neuron. So the X vector goes in, then a neuron has these weights, vector weights that it applies to the X's and then adds up, adds B. And so now this transfer function, now by the way, this is all jargon motivated by the biology. This is, and also some signal processing stuff. This transfer function is nothing more than the weighted, than using these weights to do a weighted sum of X plus adding this bias. That's all this is. And then that is fed into your activation function, which could be your sigmoid or other things. And then that is, um, into your outputs. So the jargon here just um, can just overwhelm you. Transfer function is nothing more than the weighted sum of the inputs plus the bias. B is a bias, it's just an additive term. Activation function is just a function of one variable to give one variable. And then this really should say output because I, the way I'm looking at this is that this is just for a scalar. Now, this is now the picture you will see for a single hidden layer um, 
neural net. This is the picture you're gonna see. Basically here are each of your X's and then each X gets sent to each of these nodes. Now the weight that is given to any particular X depends on the node. So the weights for X1 is for the first node is gonna be W11, et cetera. So the weights that go in here differ for each node and the biases also differ. So each of these circles represents this, this whole business here. And so then, and then it has output. And so then that output goes to some output layer and each one of these output layers takes in all of the outputs of the hidden layers and then spits out um, a vector of outputs. Now each one of these is a scalar, but it spits it out. Okay, so that is picture time. Now what we're gonna do is define here a, uh, a neural net with two dimensions with nine nodes um, we're going to use a sigmoid function, except the problem is that if X is a very big negative number, you're going to get overflow. So you truncate it, set up the optimization. This is the function I'm going to try to approximate. Here's the data collection. Here's the fit. Now, by the way, um, even this function, global optimization, et cetera, had a hard time and it took a long time. I should put the time, but this took many minutes to solve. Um, now, and so notice it said, failed to converge to the requested accuracy. Now, the standard accuracy in any of these packages is eight digits for like here. The problem is that these, these problems are very ill-conditioned, so we have to use sloppy stopping rules. And that's the case with all the neural net stuff. If you actually look at their stopping rules, they are sloppy. Um, now, in particular, you added on top of that the Monte Carlo stuff, and they have to be sloppy. Furthermore, neural net software often uses just single precision arithmetic. Why is that? Well, because they love to use GPUs, and GPUs are really good at single precision arithmetic because when it comes to creating graphics, that's all it needs. So, um, so this is one of the also sort of surprises here is that Neural nets work really well, particularly when they can get by with using single precision arithmetic, because then they can make very efficient, very powerful use of GPUs. And so what that means is that if you, since you're doing this least squares minimization stuff, you have to swallow a sloppy stopping rule. That's just a, the nature of this beast. Now, um, Here's the net, the result. Here's a little contra plot of the errors. Notice it's errors are, what I like about this is the errors are fairly uniform. Uh, here's a contra plot of the error, which um, uh, all, anyway, it's all small. And here's the contours of a true, fun, the true function. Here's contours of the neural net. So you see that basically the, the, the neural net approximation does a pretty good job. Now, as I said before, the optimization problems are hideously large. You have to move to some steepest descent methods um, and its refinements. And um, by the way, there's been a lot of success just in general in the, in the, in the math literature <coughs> on how to use steepest descent methods efficiently. In particular, um, Nesterov has come up with um, algorithms that are very successful. Um, using steepest descent. Um, and many of those ideas have been translated now and used in neural net stuff. And so then you get this, uh, this big zoo of um, different, um, uh, um, uh, kind, kinds of uh, approaches, optimization approaches. Um, so, so the, the key thing about neural nets is that this is, this is all just nonlinear least squares. That's all it is. However, um, because it's so enormous, you have to use um, uh, 
uh, optimization methods that you wouldn't use otherwise. The other thing, by the way, is that you want, you want to compute gradients. The big, the nice thing about, uh, let's say this, this is what a, a neural network with two hidden layers looks like mathematically. And now you might think, well, my God, when I come through and try to compute the, the gradient of this with, you see now basically the optimization problem for neural net fitting is optimizing over these B I's, these B vectors and the W matrices. So there's a number of unknown coefficients is enormous because each, each, vec, each component of a B vector, see these B vectors are all different. And so each, each component is, um, a, um, is an unknown parameter. All of the elements of each of these W vectors are also unknown. So you're gonna to have to take gradients with respect to the Ws and the Bs. Well, because of the structure here, it is cheap to compute the derivatives. Now they love to talk about how oh, they discovered this great stuff. They 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 discovered the chain rule, et cetera, blah blah. So they back then they said we've got back propagation to compute um, the derivatives very quickly. And that's really nothing more than automatic differentiation. Now the literature, you know, it's now that neural nets are successful. The mathematicians are coming and sort of uh, you know cleaning things up in terms of notation and understanding. Uh, so even though you have an no, enormous uh, number of unknowns, a million unknowns, it is relatively cheap to compute the gradient in the one million directions. And that's because of the structure of the, uh, of the neural net. So that's, so, they have they're very powerful in terms of soft in terms of approximation abilities, but they are also very compatible with the um, the optimization problem being and making that efficient. Now TensorFlow is the dominant neural net package. Um, if you, I've, I've occasionally taken a look at the and I can't understand any of it. The problem also is that the examples they show you are things like recognizing um, uh, handwriting. Yeah. You say, okay, here's somebody hand wrote the zero, one, two, three, the digits. And now then you're supposed to be able to recognize those. And then the other thing is, oh, and, and this is, I was at a seminar last fall where they said, oh, I got this big neural net. I think he had 60 lay hidden layers. And the objective was to um, be, be able to tell the difference between a horse and a dog. Um, using pictures. So the thing is, these, these examples that you see in these, in these books or papers have no, no conceivable relationship to economics. But the thing is that what they've done is that, you know, they, that a picture is nothing more, let's say a black and white picture is nothing more than a matrix of ones and zeros. Now, of course, you want a color picture of grays, and it's then at each pixel you have um, some, um, maybe a real number um, indicating its color or um, strength, strength of color. Um, so that's what you do: is you reduce um, the picture to a matrix of numbers or matrix of vectors, whatever. And then, um, now, by the way, the thing is that I have no idea uh, what matrices um, will uh, represent a dog versus a horse or a cat. So what they do is they, they feed in, they, they have, first of all, they have people um, look at pictures and declare whether or not something is a dog or a cat. And then basically they feed these pictures into the computer, the, the digitized version of these pictures. And then they, the game is that they, they want to get as many of these um, um, classifications correct as possible. 
Um, so it is, it is a mathematical approximation problem, but you know, it's nothing terribly that you can learn from. This is why I give you this um, to tell you that this is what is really going on. You've got to mathematize your problem. Well, our problems are, are, are already mathematical. We don't have to go through the business of, oh, it's a picture. Now we got to learn how to express that as a mathematical object. So we've got that part done and easy. And so um, now, um, so TensorFlow is used, the Python, it's horrible to look at. Python front ends are making it easier to use. Now, fortunately, there are some economists working in this area. Um, I think the earliest effort was by uh, Sergey and Lilia Maliar. Um, their web pages even have um, some links. I should, I should add links to their stuff where they show how to use this to do, um, uh, to solve macro models. And they did this, oh, let me say, there's some seminars from a couple of years ago. So they must've been doing this like three or four years ago starting. Um, and now, and now they have a son who's in college who loves helping them out. So, uh, so they've, they've got a real um, uh, uh, little machine there all set up for applying neural nets to macroeconomics. Now also there's some, uh, uh, students over in the well, Swiss Finance Institute part of the University of Zurich, um, Marlon and also Luca, who have been using neural nets to uh, solve overlapping generations models, and they've been working on that for about the last year. So, and um, uh, Philip has some um, expertise in this. So, slowly, this is starting to be used to solve the economic problems that we are interested in. So I would recommend those of you who are really nerdy um, and want to start doing serious things, uh, um, learning uh, TensorFlow as software and applying it to economic problems uh, is useful because it is the future, because the computers are only going to get faster and everything else is always going to, also going to improve. And um, this is the logo of a website or company, a company I know called Becoming Human. And I don't know if, if, if I should be insulted or take this as a joke or, or whatever. It's, um, uh, yes, we're becoming human. And I think the essence of humanity is represented by C-3PO at the, at the right end of this evolution. It looks more like evolution than devolution. Um, but anyway, this is, um, you know, this is future stuff. Now, um, I'm going to get rid now. Oh, yeah. Oh, no. The, okay. Now, here's an application that um, uh, f for, uh, for re other reasons that you'll hear about later um, that uh, Philip and I are using to um, and applying neural nets to. Now, okay, we saw the life cycle um, saving problem where you have, uh, you're choosing consumption in each period to uh, maximize uh, uh, the sum of utility, no, maximize present value of utility. Now, suppose that uh, we set time at 50 years, retirement, um, or you retire at age 40, there's, a 10% interest rate. But now suppose that you want to know how these solutions vary as you change beta and sigma. Sigma is the intertemporal elasticity substitution and beta is the discount factor. Suppose you want to know, gee, how, would, how is consumption at age 27 affected by changing beta from 0.8 to 0.9 to 0.99 or how is it affected by changing sigma? So what we're interested in is not solving just one of these. What we wanna do is solve basically the two dimensional function, the, the two input function that takes a beta and a sigma and spits out the whole vector of consumptions. That's what we want to approximate. 
You might ask why, we'll tell you, we'll get to that. But suppose we want, so we don't want to just solve one problem. We want to solve essentially a continuum of problems, but we're going to approximate it. And so he, he, the first approach here is using just write down this Euler equation. And then basically using a, 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 a you take a sigma and a beta, that's the two dimensional, um, the two dimensional input. And then you run it through, uh, th this picture is a two hidden layer neural net. And then out comes consumption time one, two, three, up to consumption time T, S, S of one, it's up to S of T plus one. So that's the neural net that, um, that we're trying to look at and solve. And uh, this is, um, uh, this is something different. Um, anyway, uh, and anyways, oh, I think in, in, here's the Euler equation and this is um, one of these has a KKT condition, so one does them anyway. So basically the optimal solution satisfies uh, this um, Lagrangian condition. So we approximate the whole solution by neural net approximations of the, basically, basically what we're doing is um, for a, we're, we're approximating, we're going to minimize the sum, the, the, the quadratic, yeah, for each W and B for these matrices and biases, we get a collection of C's and S's and lambda is a shadow price. And then we're, what we're gonna do is try to find the weighting matrix and the bias vector such that we minimize that and end up with an approximation to, um, to that function. Okay, now, um, okay, now, okay. Uh, I don't understand at all what this is, but anyway, something about um, the, now I should turn this over to Philip. Okay, should I, um, Philip, are you ready? I'm ready. So, okay, so now I'm gonna stop my share. Okay. And now then how do, I think okay. that should work now. Okay. okay. Uh, so um, let me briefly dive into the point where I uh, can skip. So what I wanted to highlight is that uh, you've seen Kazali so far, but uh, for example, TensorFlow offers AD capabilities as well. It's kind of a different syntax, but this would be a possibility to use in the exercises as well, or it might be good to um, no for your later project. So by using the gradient tape syntax and watching your variables, you want to um, derive a gradient for, you can actually end up with uh, AD gradients uh, using TensorFlow and making use of all the machinery behind the whole TensorFlow business. To, at first, let us go through the code to train the neural network briefly. It's only to highlight uh, some points. If you have seen this syntax of uh, TensorFlow, you might hopefully understand it. Otherwise, you get some idea where to start if you actually want to start learning it. So what I'm using is uh, TensorFlow 2 with the Keras uh, backend on a different way around. So I'm using Keras with the backend uh, TensorFlow. This means I um, basically have a two-dimensional input. This is our R, not, not R, it's beta and sigma. We do have two hidden layers of size 800 and 300 in this case, and we have two outputs. It's the, um, uh, yeah, the the consumption savings, exactly. Um, it's actually, this is a bit, ah, so it's savings and Lagrange multipliers. I was a bit confused. Um, as Ken has told you, there are different activation functions. In this case, we use rectified linear units, which is basically the, uh, for positive values, you have X return for the X inputs. So it's just the linear function. 
of slope one for negative inputs uh, it's zero uh, just to say that um, then the loss function are the kkt conditions I'm not going into details there but then at the end uh, to train the neural network it's basically only um, staying model fit giving your training inputs and then it's running let's go to the um, visualization results see um, everything okay now what we have here are the solutions for the savings and consumption we have two sliders where we can adjust it and with changing the sliders the neural network which was previously previously trained is evaluated and as you can see it's nice and uh, fast so if you want to solve for a solution manifold and evaluate for specific values like in this case details and sigmas to use um, in your computation at any point or to have like a solution in, for your paper uh, new networks offer a good tool for that i'll put that online it should have been online by uh, clicking launch binder however um, it did not want it to start so it tells me launching server and takes some time but as soon as it's online you'll be able to play around with it um, get a feeling of it and um, yeah that's basically it any questions so far Now, I want to emphasize just how I un, unusual what you're seeing. In fact, I can't, I can't offhand think of you seeing anything like this ever before. What you're used to seeing is, okay, given this, um, given a problem, with fix these parameters, this beta, this sigma, this whatever, solve it. And then um, maybe you wanna know what happens if uh, the interest rate is somewhat different. So you pick another interest rate and then you solve it for that interest rate. Maybe you wanna try another sigma, solve it for that sigma. What you're seeing here is creating a function that will take any beta, any sigma within a range and tell you what the answer is. Now the neural net, by the way, some of these, some of these life cycle problems might have taken a long time to solve for some reason. Maybe you know, we can come, come up with ones that are difficult because of constraints um, that may be binding or not, but that is something that Philip did offline. And then you gather up the data and then you run, you train a neural net. You basically just you find the coefficients of a neural net that fit the data. And now what you're essentially doing is with this trained neural net, you pick any beta, any sigma within this range. It doesn't have to be one of those that were pre-computed. Pick any of them and you have the solution. And, and quickly rapidly you have the solution now i can't think of any other time in economics where i've seen this done so um this is um it now you might you know why would you ever want to do this well one of my um extra lectures will be on actually why you want to do this um, and the, the bottom line here is that many times we're in this, we're trying to study something about how a parameter is going to affect the outcome. And so what we do is we solve for this parameter and that parameter, or, or that people do robustness checks by solving it, solving, resolving the problem for like four or five other values. 
I don't like that. I want to see the graph of how results change as you change the parameter. I want to see the graph. I don't want to just see two points. Um, because by the way, the author can easily pick the two points that emphasize his points. So I want to see the whole graph and not just in one dimension of, of two dimension. I want that. That's what I want to see. That's what you're trying to, when you're doing um, um, robust tests, that's, that's what you're trying to do. But just showing me that resolving it for a few other points doesn't really, there's nothing to trust there. I mean, nothing generalizable. But I want to see the whole manifold of solutions as a function of the parameters. And this is what Philip accomplished here. Now, there are many times in economics where you want to do this. Now, first of all, there's a lot of computation that went behind this. Philip had to solve a lot of these um, uh, life cycle problems in order to gather the data for the neural net. Well, but that's easy because that, that's offline and, and it's embarrassingly parallelizable. So massive parallelization can be used to do that. And then once you've gathered up the data, you can then fit a neural net to match the data. And then if, if your, your data, if your parameter set was chosen sensibly, then by interpolation, you will have a good approximation. And by the way, Notice that neural nets did a good job even when we had kinks. So even if there's like a kink in this manifold of solutions with respect to some parameter, um, the neural nets are able to handle it. So um, this, it, what you're seeing here is, it looks very simple, basic, all that, but think of the idea that's behind all, think of what the goal is. The goal is to take the range of parameter values and being able to solve out the model for any vector within a continuous box or within a hypercube. And you are assuming that, of course, the solutions are themselves well behaved with respect to the parameters. Yes, but of course, we're making that assumption anyway. But it doesn't have to be all that well behaved because you could have kinks in this manifold and the neural net can handle it. So that's what you're seeing here is, um, and I want to emphasize, I, if so, correct me if I'm wrong, I have never seen this done before in economics. Um, and so this is an example of the kind of thing you can do. But by the way, <laughs> notice it's not just going to be using your laptop and MATLAB. Or maybe it is, but uh, it's a lot of time, you know, it consumes a lot of time. Now, if this should, if, if nothing seems to have really um, impressed economists to the point to get them to go to uh, massive parallelization and tools, if this doesn't, then I totally give up on economists. Uh, this is what can be done. And with this, uh, there's so many things that become so much easier to do. So, Philip, did you have any more comments on this? Um, maybe just briefly, because uh, you mentioned the uh, well-behaviedness of uh, the functions. Uh, note that we actually plot now for sigma equal to one. However, yeah. I did not do the log uh, extension during the training, so it's all um, coming from the uh, divided by one minus sigma, actually. Yeah, because the thing is that I think we all understand that the log solution, uh, you, you're, you're solving for the log solution just by interpolating. Yeah, well, by, by assembling random points, I yeah. never get to the exact yeah. point, uh, and then... Yeah. Um, yeah. Now, by the way, uh, yeah, um, Philip just mentioned how he what 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 choices for beta and sigma did he use? Um, he said he cho chose a random 
collection of points in that um, uh, square. Um, now, now how, ma how many cases did you start with, did you use? How many points? Uh, I did use uh, 10,000 yeah. uh, set of points. Yeah, Ish. okay. So Meng Li asked uh, how many times you need to resolve a problem to create the training data. So maybe that's a good point to emphasize here. Uh, we are not solving the life cycle problem by optimizing it. However, we solve the, uh, we find the solutions to the KKT conditions. So we try to find the oh, oh. outputs such that okay, okay. the KKT sure. conditions are um, yes, okay. fulfilled. So it's basically okay, I, mis I misspoke. I misspoke. So there was no off. Okay. What I okay. What one can do is to create an enormous data set of stuff and then use a neural net to uh, fit that data to the parameters. What Philip did is actually just wrote down the oil system of Euler equations and then found what functions um, of the parameters solve the problem out. So he, he didn't do the pre-computation the pre stuff. I, I did not do the Euler yeah. equations because I did want to do it more generally. So yeah, I yeah. only used the um, KKD conditions. Yeah, yeah, okay. Not so that's, um, yes, good, so sorry. Yeah. So what? What he did is he, you see, like um, one way to think about it is in our, in our growth, you know, in our, let's say those uh, simple growth models that we had, uh, we picked the parameter beta, sigma, whatever, and then we solved for that one function, f of x, uh, c of k. Now, what Philip can do, if he wanted, he, he can now think of solving for the consumption function, not only as a function of K, but also as a function of the parameters. And then now what he's doing is a, would be a projection method to solve out, not only just in the K dimension, but also in the dimension of the parameters. Mm -hmm. So that's another, um, yeah, so that's, sorry, I got that. Right. What I was thinking of is that there are some problems that I'm thinking of doing where I, this, I, I don't think this could be done with, let's say, I don't think this could be done before Philip wants his PhD completed. Um, however, uh, doing this way, however, the other way to go is to do massive parallelization where you solve it out for a bunch of beta, sigmas, whatever, massive, gather in a data, use that as data set, and then fit the neural net to that. And so what um, uh, this approach has its, has its great value, I like it, um, but, but you know, I, anybody who knows me know I can take any method you come up with and come up with a problem which uh, you know, blows it up. Um, so uh, this is, um, so the, the, the broader thing is using massive parallelization uh, solve out a, continue, a large number of difficult problems and then interpolate and then, um, and then give, and then represent the whole range of solutions in a fashion like he did here. So I got, yeah, I, I got things, okay. So I gotta cl clear that up, but I hope, did, now, okay. Uh, oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> How, okay, uh, first, to, the first question on the list is, how many times do we need to resolve the problem in order to create the training data? Uh, you know, I don't know, that depends on the problem. See, but again, what you can do is solve the problem out for a certain number, of, you know, for a large number of times, and then you do this fitting, and then what you do is you do some out of sample. You say, well, no, solve it for some cases that weren't involved in training the neural net and see how well it did. See, this is trust, but verify. So you trust the neural net, you see what the answer gives you, but then you verify it on some other new data. 
And if it doesn't do well, well, then you do bring in more data. You generate more. See, this is what's so wonderful about this as opposed to empirical work. You know, you, off, you, you have your data set in empirical work and you're not getting stuff you like. Well, you're screwed then, you're done. No, we can generate as much data as we need in order to answer the question, in order to find the approximations. And so trust but verify, and if it doesn't work, you don't have to find a new thesis topic, you just need to generate more data to do your fitting. Now, could we use something like this to illustrate how optimal policy of whatever changes with parameters? <laughs> yes, that's what we're doing. Um, and that will be the topic of um, a, one of my uh, extra lectures. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's some, okay. I, I, so I, so uh, you, you kind of see, it's, it's always nice to see that somebody sees where I'm going. Um, no, the, the, here's, here's one, of the, one of the applications is that, you know, solving out optimal taxation problems in a dynamic stochastic problem, you write it down, write down the first order conditions and all that. It is an abs insanely complex math problem. You have no chance at all of solving it. Uh, there were a couple of mathematicians at Argonne who I said, well, let's work on doing optimal taxation stuff. And that they just wanted to write it down with all the KKT conditions and all this kind of stuff. And even then I said, that's nah, not gonna work. They didn't like my idea of doing it this way. And nothing happened. They could never, they know, there's no hope of doing this, but with that way, but by doing this neural net stuff and creating database, massive, using massive parallelization to create a database of, 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 that you can then use uh, to uh, do an approximation like this, and then you can solve um, optimization problems of all sorts. Now, by the way, Oh, we're running out of time, but I want to leave you with one last thought. And one last assertion on my part. This is the way empirical work should also be done. Bye-bye.